Agricola. Oh boy. <sighs> All right. So a friend of mine, I use the term lightly, who uh, kind of understands my taste a little bit, told me I would really despise this. That's fine. But you would have to go out of your way really, really hard. I think, to design a game that anybody liked at any level, <laughs> that I despise more than that. I mean, it, it's like this was, this was designed to make me really hate it for so many reasons. Not all of them, and certainly not mo the, the most important of them for any objective reason. Uh, in particular, the things that I hate most about it is, uh, one, it's completely unconnected to any reality about farming. It has nothing to do with it. The only reason the pieces are aligned with various farming things is to give you some sort of mnemonic response to, like, you know, uh, the fact that little animals have to go in pastures and stuff like that. But... The, me the mechanisms that are at play for the game make no sense at all. You can plow and plant any time during the year. Um, the year starts off with five seasons, goes to, well, four, four seasons that you can use. Goes down to three, then two, then one at the very end. Uh, which means, you know, your harvests are coming faster and faster and you're going to have a harder and harder time feeding your people. <clears throat> um, restrictions on actions are problematic. The action selection mechanism in that, like, you know, hey, I want to plow a field. Well, that means nobody else gets to plow a field. <laughs> uh, I, I find the solution in Puerto Rico a lot more elegant, which is somebody picks it gets a bonus, everyone else gets to do the same thing. I just find that a, a, a much more reasonable, where everybody has access to being able to do those things, right? There may be cases where it makes sense that only one person can get something. So, you know, laying claim to some resource or something, it makes sense, but it doesn't make a lot of sense uh, the way the resources stack up and whatnot. Just across the board, this is an abstract game that was too complicated to make as an abstract game. And people don't like pure abstracts, a lot of them. So it, it's one of, I guess, a fairly early one of the more modern Euros. And yeah, it was such a big hit that it spawned this whole, whole flavor. The other big thing that for me is, is horrendous, is analysis paralysis. Um, the way the choices align in this game, the number of choices that you get, the fact that there's nothing to intuitively drive you towards one solution or another, um, all help in, in this. And they're, they're all, you know, part of that problem. I don't have a lot of analysis paralysis when I'm facing a situation where I can see what the value of something is on a price chart and see how many other people are holding it and kind of understand how that's all going to affect the value, a la Silverton. I don't have that kind of paralysis, usually, in an 18xx game <coughs> where you know, I can evaluate the potential values of the roots that are out there and choose which stock to purchase. I can be faced with complex sets of decisions and not feel frozen and not feel completely uh, point, uh, unable to make a choice. Some games give you really hard choices. I know some of you love this, and that's probably why this game is... Uh, desirable to you because the choices are really fucking hard you know you're looking at a manifold of options um which 
if you don't, you're going to pay an opportunity cost for whatever you take because someone else will step on something else that you want. There are valuable spaces that are out there and you have to choose amongst them. In and of itself, I don't know if that's that bad, the action, the selection uh, of, of choices in itself, although I hate that. And that seems to be the focus of worker placement, and therefore almost all worker placement type games um, are really, really unpleasant for me. Uh, but you add to that the fact that you have to chain your decisions, uh, that opportunistic choices generally don't work at all the way you want them to. You really have to pre-plan and know what you're going for. And... The manifold over which you're trying to make these choices just becomes too big for me to hold in my head in any sort of way. Uh, if I played a lot of it, I might get moderately okay at it or something. You know, I might, I might be able to... Uh, yeah, what, what I noticed was in my first play, I made a lot of mistakes very early on um, at a period where I wouldn't make that mistake again. As later play went... Uh, in, in the second in the second game, um, I'm sure I made mistakes, and I'm sure you guys can can spot them if you, for some reason, wanted to go through my tirades. But uh, you know, the game sort of fell apart in the late to mid game, where the choices just became too many uh, to face at any particular time. And what's worse is you have to make too many of the choices each turn because about the only way forward in this game, about, uh, uh, about the only really reasonable strategy is to grow your family. Now, I'm not good at figuring out how to do that necessarily, but uh, I figured out that I should do that. And by that late mid period of the game, everybody had more options. Some of them, uh, uh, you know, Double, double the size, say, four instead of two. Um, the cards. This is the one thing. Uh, yeah, work well. These are the one thing that differentiate you from the other players. Because honestly, you're looking at a fixed position where all the choices uh, are, you know, are exactly the same to everyone, and there's very little variance between games in terms of the board setup. You have certain cards for the board eh, that change, you know, at what uh, point in the game a particular action card becomes available. And that can be very important to, to someone, depending on what their planning level is, but you have a, it's not completely random or, some, or anything like that. They're fixed to the point where it's one of three or one of two most of the time. Uh, but it could end up causing you um, some kinks in your plan uh, in terms of getting your people fed. Because in addition to growing more people, Getting your people fed is a, is a key element. Um, getting your people fed is not a trivial task. Growing your population is a harder task. And then optimizing over the point salad um, is a nightmarish task, <laughs> you know, especially since you're doing it from the beginning of the game, trying to figure out how to get yourself uh, to, to a certain period. Now, I mean, my feeling is, let, let, let's go to what my impressions are of the game, and honestly, you can probably use these more, if you're a fan of Agricola, to kind of say, well, he's so wrong on that, I'm pretty sure he doesn't know what he's talking about on any games. And I think that's a fair assessment, because um, the first thing that I came up with is, look, this game is about figuring out how to make those engines work, and there's not that much differentiation between games. 
Whoever's the first player is going to grab X almost all the time. Now, the cards are the different, are, 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 are the cards that a player holds are the one thing that differentiates them from other players. So they're the one thing that's going to shake that up. But we'll get to them in a bit. If you took the cards out of the game, and I don't know if that's what the family game does, I seem to remember something about that. Um, if you took the cards out of the game, then what you wanted, it also, it definitely has different, different actions available. If you took the cards out of the game, um, it strikes me that you could calculate near optimal play. You can't do fully optimal because there is a little bit of perturbation on the order that the actions come out. So if you try, if you tried to get the optimal play sequence, you might guess it wrong, right? Um, but you could pretty much figure out what is the best path forward to get your engine to the best situation. And I would say somebody who's decent at being able to figure out these kind of games could probably do that within five games, you know? And then at that point, the game's over, right? You know, I mean, if somebody can figure out what the optimal strategy is, and that doesn't necessarily mean maybe there's something else hiding there and somebody finds it. But you know, with the internet or whatever, people who really care about that might just go look it up and <laughs> find out what that optimal strategy is. So even if you enjoy exploring the game without the cards again, uh, there's, there's a tight limit on how much game there is. Now, It's also an unpleasant activity for me to figure out, uh, you know, that puzzle. But whatever. It's not like I'm going to play this. E even if I liked it, I probably wouldn't play it five times uh, with the amount of games that I have and the, the, the desires for playing that I have. Um, certainly, if you played it a lot more than five times, you could get to the point where it's almost automatic what you choose, I think. And you really, you know you would be faced with maybe a couple of little uh, little side calls as to, well, do I want to do this or do I want to do that? But for the most part, you'd understand the base strategy well enough that there's, you know, you're not going to be agonizing over that the way that I was. And that would be kind of the pleasant thing. If this was the only game that I had around and played it all the time, you know, yeah, I'd get confident enough at it, I guess. I don't know, maybe not. But, uh, but what the cards end up doing is they give you a big pile of choices of things that give you additional advantages that you can take into, into account. And occupations are generally paid for just by the action that you play them on, which does have a small cost in food, um, which early in the game is kind of painful to do. But later on, if you have a good engine going, you can probably afford it, but that cost in food might be costing you victory points as well. So it's just something to keep in mind. Um, and, and yeah, when, when I was talking about the um, alignment of stuff, so like food stuff that rots over the years, you can store forever and is worth victory points at the end of the game. Animals are also worth victory points at the end of the game. I'm willing to accept that in a little different way as with permanent structures that you build. Stocks of material like rocks that are incredibly valuable in the game towards getting you to where you want to go or wood or whatever um, have no value at the end of the game. And that... That actually may be one of the selling points of it, is that you have to get through this intermediate stage. You have to pick up. I, dis I despise it because it means you can't play intuitively at all. But you have to get through an intermediate stage and dispose of all those resources. And that kind of reminds me a little bit of Bazaar, which is fitting because it's a fully abstract game, just a far more complicated one. And I dislike Bazaar too, so don't worry about that. <laughs> But yeah, you're, 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 um, with the cards. And, and, and see, this is the thing, like with the replayability issue, it's not really, it, it's obviously that, uh, it's obvious that I'm wrong, 
because people give this game tens, which means they're always willing to play it if you're following BGG's uh, standards, which I don't. Uh, but I would assume a fair number of these people are always willing to play this game. Um, that means it's like the best, maybe the best thing in the world for them, but at the very least, if they're willing to play games, the best game that they could be given an option to do, or among the best, in the sense that, you know, yeah, it, it just boggles my mind, but um, you certainly wouldn't, those kind of raiders, and, and I think, uh, say, half of BGG at least rates things on that level, those kind of raiders are not going to play you know, something that they rated 10, five times, especially since it's not that long a game. Um, it's long for a Euro, but, you know, if you like it that much, you're, you're going to make sure you play it a few times a year, at least. I would guess. My 10s don't count that way, so that's okay. And that's why this game has a 4 instead of a 1, because I can't conceive of why anybody would want to play this to any degree, rather than, say, cut off their fingers or something. Um, but again, I'm trying to remain objective in it um, as much as I can. But, you know, where I put my objective view, again, it seems obviously wrong, because there are people who have rated this a 10, and therefore love it that much. Um, so, with the cards, the only thing that differentiates you from different games, I have a number of different views on the cards. <clears throat> My first view was, oh, these cards are what makes your games different. Therefore, they should significantly shape your play. I'm not convinced of that. I think that a player who ignores their cards for the most part, for the most part, can build up their engine following a pat set of rules in a way that is probably um, about as good as you can get uh, with trying to work with your cards heavily. That's not to say, you know, there are times when your card is going to be worth a couple of victory points to you. You can just see it, and, and it's not hard to make that figuring. Although, having to go through a deck of 14 cards, because hand is a, well, yeah, it's a bridge hand, you know, <laughs> plus one. It's a baker's bridge hand. Um, having to go through uh, a hand that large and read every card and try to figure out what you're going to do, well... Some of them will just jump out and you'll say, oh, that's exactly what I need right now. And I don't think that, uh, I don't think it's a good idea to say, I, I, I wouldn't put those aside. Like, that kind of decision making, I think you'd still want to be able to do, where you're making your optimization choices based on the spaces, where the occupations and, and improvements can be put in. You also get improvements for free at times in terms of an action selection, you still have to pay for them, whatever the, the cost is for the improvement card. But I don't think that in general the cards really have to shape your play. My first thought was they, they're they your advantage, man. That's what you have to do. If you don't take advantage of those cards and focus on them, you're falling behind. What that means is that the cards are largely not that important to your play of the game. They're added little bonuses um, that can help you early on, they can help you towards victory points at the end, and the majority of them you probably aren't going to need to play. That's one possible view of it. Another possible view, and the one that I walked in with, was these cards are really important, the synergies are really important, you want to be able to work your synergies of your cards and use that as your strategy and devolve your, your, your planning on that. Uh, well, given who I am and how hard this game is to plan for, and I've got to swap batteries, I'm unable to make a fair uh, assessment of you know, did I just totally screw that up? Or, you know, 
it, is somebody more competent than I am able to make those synergies work? If that's the case, let's say the synergies are the key. And that's what I was kind of hoping at the beginning of the game and thought it was kind of interesting. There's definitely a balance issue. Uh, in the same way, dealing out multiple powers in a big old old style game of Cosmic Encounter has a balance issue, right? There might be combinations of cards that are just too good. There also might be individual cards that are just too good. Um, I saw some I saw some indications of that in there, and also saw a lot of cards that uh, just weren't that good. But again, I don't trust my evaluations on this on two plays of a game that I fucking hate. Okay, I was trying to avoid those. Uh, but the. Um, so, so in that case, the cards could be a wildly unbalancing factor. Okay, other players can make up for that wild unbalance by taking actions against you, right? Not really. In this game, the only real uh, capability you have to screw around with other people is taking uh, the limited actions. Sometimes they're resources, but quite often... The resources are available to anybody who wants them, maybe not in exactly the quantity that they want. And the quantity might be more important than some other choice. But taking the actions. The actions are, are the item in limited supply. The, the things that you're allowed to do. So if there's only one plow of field space in, in the game, which there is in the four-player game for most of the game, then... You know, I gotta evaluate how vital is it for me to get that field plowed. That might be the thing I need to do. Um, yeah, but anyway, um, I, I was trying, I think I was saying something that was a little unrelated and got lost. And, and, now, and now my whole riff is gone. <laughs> uh, right, so... I, I think I was looking at the unbalanced, uh, about the potential unbalancing value of the cards. Uh, if, if, they, if they truly are uh, unbalancing uh, combinations or individual cards, yeah, there's no way for anyone to really get back at you and prevent your un, unfair combination uh, from kind of ruling the game. And that's sort of the same. Um, so so what, what, what's problematic about that, in addition, even if there was a way, your cards are hidden to begin with. So until you play that combination and it's available for other people to see, they have no idea that you have something that nasty, right? Uh, my experience is, though, that the card synergies might be enough to make certain cards that aren't powerful on their own worth playing. Uh, and for the most part, the cards are not going to rule the game. They're more of an add-on, an action that you can take to bring, especially with the occupations, to bring a card into play uh, when you can't, be, because the improvements you often have victory points associated with them. Uh, an improvement you can bring into play uh, when there really aren't any other good options for you available. And uh, some of them appear valuable, but it's too hard to make them work. So they're kind of, uh, if you think that they're all equal, they're probably not, you know. Uh, but that again, this is my opinion on it from... It's the opinion of someone who can't make the game, you know, work for him and, and figure out how to optimize across the board. I had highly variable uh, scores, which is an indication that somebody was making reasonable choices and other people weren't stopping them from making the choices and weren't able to make equally reasonable choices on their own. So 
you know, whatever, whatever that, that comes around to. Uh, it, it shows, you know, my inexperience shows. But, again, my feeling is that the experience of the game is a training factor, a learning curve, rather than um, an enabling curve. Uh, and what I mean by that is, when a game enables you, it allows you to implement a strategy And the strategy and thinking about that is where the actual fun of trying to be competitive is and trying to see if you can outscore someone or whatever. The idea of a learning curve um, being very sharp to get you to that at all competent level. Uh, that, that troubles me greatly. Like, I was a lot less worried about strategy, although, you know, whatever, as feeding my family and moving towards some place where my score isn't going to be horrible, I wasn't able to uh, sort of lucidly come up with too many strategies Although I could, I could come up with a strategy, I had no idea how to implement it, is basically what it comes down to. So, uh, to me, that's kind of problematic. A game should make it easy for you to know how to do the thing that you picture in your head. It's the picturing that combination that's kind of the tricky thing. And, of course, they can't be run away, whatever. Uh, a lot of it didn't feel like there were a whole... So, you know, there's this path to victory, whatever. Well, this giant manifold pa uh, point uh, salad, in a sense, is almost the definition of multiple paths to victory. Although, given that there's penalization um, for not having something, for whatever that's worth, I mean, it doesn't make much difference. Um... Essentially, the, the value of having the first one of it or whatever is more than of the later ones. Uh, means that uh, you kind of have to blanket across everything to some level. You, you can't just focus on one thing. You can't, like, dominate the grain market or something like that. Uh, which, from an economic standpoint... Cornering a market is generally better than being one of many in it, but we'll leave that alone. Uh, nobody, yeah, nobody needs, nobody's dependent on your resources for the most part. There are some cards, and I think they're from the interactive deck, that, you know, if somebody de takes an action, you get a bonus out of it. But they're not really, a, there's nothing in the, in the lines of being able to give someone you know, sell someone resources or something. It's all handled as if it's this giant multiplayer solitaire. The only interaction is really with stealing limited, not resources, but things a person could do. Which again comes to the, hey, you know, does this represent any subject matter? Yeah, I'm going to go out and plot till the field today. That way none of the neighbors will... Oh, be able to do it. <laughs> no. Uh, but anyway. The impressions that I'm getting from this limited play and poor play are that even as a game, it shouldn't be that good. Uh, it should have limited plays. It should have... It, it either has limited plays because uh, the cards don't matter enough to really influence your strategy, or if the cards are that important, they're going to wildly unbalance the game. Unfortunately, it may actually be worse than that. It may be both. <laughs> uh, this is sort of the worst case scenario, and I've seen some people claim this, which is that 
not only is the base strategy and kind of end goals going to be the same because you have to get a little bit of everything or a lot of everything or whatever um, because you're competing over the same options of things to do and there's really a certain progression that you have to make. You have to get your food engine working. You have to uh, then, then pick up other stuff. Uh, and, and, and get it built up so that it can work. And it's all chaining, so it all requires pre-planning to do, which I'm horrible at, right? That's the AP problem, but... Um, and... Then, most of the cards mean almost nothing. This was the claim that I saw. And, you know, some of my experience kind of... corresponds with that. Putting out a bunch of cards, even if there's a synergy, didn't necessarily help people all that much. Uh, there's a cost in terms of what you get on the main board if you're trying to put out a lot of cards that have a synergy, and the synergy generally doesn't tend to work all that well. But that there are some, so that for the most part, the cards are too weak to have much influence on the game, that you want to focus on other things, that there's sort of a bonus that you might bring in uh, at certain times, and some of them you need to bring in early for them to be of value. And then that there's some cards that are overpowered, that just having these cards and being able to get them into play um, can give you a pretty big advantage. Now, again, almost none of them are just going to give you a big advantage period at the end, right? You're going to have to plan and you're going to have to work with them. So, you know... Anyone who hasn't played it enough, uh, enough, and certainly I'm deep in that category, uh, can't really tell you how, how overpowered that the card is or how underpowered, you know, how much most of the cards are not valuable. But again, my feel, so, so the worst case situation is there aren't that many different path, real paths to victory. Uh, it really is a... Yeah, you know, you can take this detour or this detour, uh, but you're going to end up at the same place in the end. <laughs> and the card, because the cards don't have much effect. <clears throat> and a few of the cards are important enough to just completely unbalance the game and, you know, just lift one person up from, from that card. Anyway. A very uninformed view, um, and one that is not going to get any better because this was such an unpleasant experience. I mean, I, I, I want to reiterate, if I only rated games based on how much enjoyment I get out of them, this would be in the one or two at rate area. It moved up. I had it at five because it was just my, it was just unpleasant, and I dropped it down to four um, because of how bad the end game got, how 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 bad the choices got there, uh, the combination of not having anything to do with uh, the actuality of farming and 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 just breaking preconceptions left and right, so that your ideas of what you should be doing don't really make sense, you know, um, along with that huge AP burden for what turns out to just be a point salad at the end. Uh, there's just nothing to recommend this game uh, as far as I see it, Maybe, you know, and I... <laughs> I picked it up because it had such a damn high rating, but it was maybe the turning point of where Euros kind of finally just went over an edge and said, here's what we're going to be. And I think that there's sort of a, a split in Euro players at this point. I know that there was a few years ago where, you know, they're like, well, Nobody ever rates the games that, like, they actually play the most, the highest, <laughs> because those games don't have all that much depth, but part of that is because they're an hour-and-a-half game or a 30-minute game or whatever. But 
obviously people want to play them more, you know, and it's an interesting, it's an interesting argument, and, and you had one set of people who just do not like these heavy games, yet like the kind of Euro style that I was used to, um, not that I'm a fan of, but that I was used to, uh, which kind of was, uh, you know, the stuff from the 90s, where the games generally didn't have uh, a whole lot of comp uh, a whole lot of rules in them. Yeah, I, I didn't even get into the rules on this. I didn't get into components. I mean, the rule book, tiny, tiny font, but there may, I'm sure there's other editions out there that maybe they made it so that it's like readable. Not for the main rules. The main rules are fine, but when you get to the compendium of the cards and all that, and it's incomplete because there's expansions in this, and the expansions don't come with compendiums of their own, apparently, or at least whoever uh, sold this to me didn't think to include them if they did. But, uh, yeah, there's there's a segment, uh, a fair-sized segment of people who are, like, not at all interested in, in, in the newer style Euros. Um, they want that sort of what used to be the goal, a clean, easy-to-play, easy-to-understand game that allowed you a fair amount of uh, strategic choice. And the problem is, those are really hard games to design. It's actually not that hard to big, build a big, complex point salad manifest and, and try to, you know, challenge players with figure out how to play this game right. And, you know, it takes plenty of plays if it's a, a fairly long game like this is. I mean, that, not fairly long by my terms, you know, but fairly long for Euro players. Well, yeah, they might play it a few times. They'll be like, ooh, I really like it because of the depth, because I still don't know what I'm doing or something like that. The very things that I hate uh, are the things that, you know, are leading them to think that it's a good game or something. I, I, I don't know. Um, and I may be completely wrong. You know, I, I actually kind of assume I'm completely wrong, <laughs> which is the thing, because there's got to, you know, you, you can't get this kind of uh, amount of popularity uh, from people if, uh, if there's not something under it, right? You know, it's, it, we're not talking about a flashy, uh, pretty game with lots of minis or something like that. We're talking about something where the key to the, the game has to be <clears throat> the depth of the decisions that are being made. And to me, that's the, the way that people must be defining that is the quantity of pre-planning that has to be done. And then flexibility afterwards, whatever. But if you don't really, really clearly know what you're going to do with this, with this, with this, um, even if everything goes right, you're just going to end up with a mishmash of garbage like I do. Uh, but, yeah. And uh, that the game st allows many different strategies that, if planned correctly, will get you to, to the right place. Um, I don't see either of those here. <laughs> I just don't see it. And that's, that's uh, you know, either telling on my capability after two plays, uh, but usually I only do one, so, you know, uh, or, uh, or the, the, the existence of the mass opinion at all. All right, that's it.